Okay. Thanks for that, Simon. I'll just quickly redo that. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for coming out. Um, I just wanted to kind of do a quick overview seminar on how to make scientific figures um, and really kind of just go into depth on um, how the the process of taking figures you already have and improving them as well as maybe go over some uh, other items that could be useful for folks. And with that, let's get started. So as I was mentioning uh, first time around, um, I want to just briefly touch on software and tools to use for making figures, um, go through some step-by-step -step examples for improving existing figures, uh, kind of talk about the, the thought process and the design process of designing a figure. Um, and if we have time, I can go through some demos and ask some questions. It's pretty much up to all of you what um, you think will be useful. Uh, and to kind of get things started, uh, I guess the first thing to really ask is, so why should you care about figures in, in your scientific work? Um, and there's, there's really a lot of reasons. I, I'd say, uh, one, of the, one of the first things is that figures are usually one of the first items someone will look at when they're looking at a manuscript. You, usually you see the title, see if it's something that's useful for you. You might browse through the abstract, at least for me, and I think for a lot of people, you'll, you'll browse the figures and you'll see, okay, is, this, is there data in here that looks relevant or useful for me? Or is this something that looks interesting that I want to know more about? Um, and having good figures are really important in effectively conveying information. Um, and really, as, as scientists, we're trying to, one, discover new things, but we're trying to discover new things so that we can share it with the rest of the scientific community. And if you can't effectively do that, then you're, um, you're lowering the impact of your, of your work. So really, you want to have, have good science, but you also want to be able to communicate it uh, effectively. And if you're curious about what bad figures look like, there's a link in this, uh, in this PowerPoint down here. I'll send this out later. Um, and there's kind of a graph on the side. I was Googling, so what is the top 10 worst uh, graphs? And there's a, this figure comes up a lot in these articles. Um, and it's basically this complicated 3D, I guess, bar histogram chart, which you can't actually see one, what color is really what in here. You can't see the differences that's trying to be explained. There's no <laughs> figure cache. There's no uh, labels on any of the axes. There's a lot of things wrong with this. So let's try not to do that. Um, so really kind of backing off too. Um, so what, what is a figure comprised of? So here's an example figure out of a paper from our lab. Uh, this was published in Science Translational Medicine. Uh, and there's, there's a few components of a figure. There's usually uh, maybe some schematics. And so the purpose of the schematics are to convey concepts or processes that are difficult to explain with just, just words. So you, it's there to add uh, kind of visualization to help guide the, guide the reader. Um, and there's usually uh, some data. And the purpose of the data is to show proof of your findings, to really reinforce uh, what are the conclusions you made from your, from your experiments, your simulations, um, whatever you, you determined. Um, and lastly, there's, there's a figure caption. And this is also a very important point. So the, the figure caption should provide any detail that is, necess that is necessary to understand the figure. Um, and you're not going to be able to do it 100%. You're not going to, but you should always kind of strive to have a, have a figure caption that is, that is short and concise. Um, but can also uh, explain to someone just, just reading and skimming through um, what's going on. And then within that, uh, you're going to want to, usually you want to have a first sentence that um, just summarizes the entire figure. So the idea is you're, you're really starting from like summarizing, this is what this figure does. And then in the following sentences, you're going to talk through in concise points uh, what you're trying to convey with, uh, with this figure. Uh, and so like, for example, in this figure right here, um, they're talking about using a microfluidic chip in order to look at the deformity of, of cells taken from patients and seeing if how these cells deform and flow correlates to um, whether it's cancerous or not. Great. Um, so if you wanna actually go about making, making your own figures, 
uh, what type of software can you use? Uh, so typically people for plotting data, at least people like to use Excel. There's things like origin, MATLAB, Python, there's R. There's really a ton of different toolboxes you can use to plot things. Uh, and honestly, it doesn't matter what you use as long as you can uh, use it to convey the information you want to convey. I personally uh, prefer using MATLAB for most of my data plots, just because I'm familiar with it. I do a lot of my analysis in MATLAB. I know a lot of other people use it. Uh, sometimes Excel is easier for doing things really quickly, uh, but you just really want to be familiar with whatever, uh, with whatever software that you're using. But really, you can make any fig good figures with, it, with any software if you spend enough time um, really just kind of learning it and getting a feel for it. In terms of making schematics, uh, I personally prefer to do uh, mostly 2D schematics. You can do these in PowerPoint, uh, really simple. So if you're doing uh, something really quick, uh, there's more slightly complex software like Adobe Illustrator, Corel Draw, and Inkscape. Um, in terms of, uh, so, so for me, I, I use PowerPoint if I need to do something really quick. It's pretty intuitive to use. They have a lot of shapes built in. Um, but for most of my figures, I actually use Inkscape, which is a, a free kind of professional-ish grade uh, vector graphic software. It takes a little bit of time to get used to it. But when you do become proficient with it, you're able to make pretty nice uh, figures uh, relatively easily. In terms of 3D, I actually stay away from 3D as much as possible because it tends to take a lot of time. Some people are good with it and can get some nice figures out of it. Uh, Blender is a free software people use a lot. Uh, Auto, Autodesk has things like Inventor. There's uh, SolidWorks is another uh, program. I think uh, Simon here has used uh, SolidWorks a bit for making some 3D graphics. Uh, and Autodesk is another one, Fusion 360. Uh, this one I actually like because it's, uh, I've used it a little bit. It's free. It seems pretty intuitive. Um, Blender as a program for doing 3D stuff, it's powerful, but it's really difficult to use. So I don't tend to, I, I never really kind of got hooked on it, but some people use it and that works for them. Uh, but I, I, I mostly stick with this, with the 2D. Um, you really want to avoid overcomplicating things if you don't need to. So if you can convey most of your information with a simple 2D schematic that looks somewhat nice, I think that's, uh, that'll do 90% uh, for you. Uh, what about paint? Yeah, so there's some software that you might be thinking of that I did not mention at all. Uh, and this kind of segues into my next point of, so vector images versus bitmap images. Uh, so a vector image is a, is a image file that is, uh, all the information is conveyed in, uh, you can think of it as like almost like equations or uh, a mathematical representation of lines and gradients and other shapes. So it's, whereas a bitmap is literally just, if we had a kind of a gridded uh, sheet, we would assign colors to each, each square. And so when you see, the difference you see in these is usually when you're, when you're zooming in, or when you're when you're transferring data between different software, um, if you if you magnify a vector image, uh, no matter how far you zoom in, you'll still have crisp lines. Whereas a bitmap, you'll lose resolution as you as you zoom in. Uh, so generally, uh, vector images are nice for making schematics. It's nice for handling data because if you ever need to adjust anything, you're always going to preserve um, the quality as well as all the all the information there. So bitmap. So Photoshop, GIMP, Paint, uh, these are all software that people used to, uh, to make these types of images. I usually don't, I won't use these for any kind of scientific figures. Uh, vector graphics, so Illustrator, Inkscape, PowerPoint, some of the other ones I mentioned on the other previous slide. Um, these are all great. They have, uh, there's different vector formats. So, so bitmap formats, so TIFF, JPEG, PNG, BMP, these are examples. You use these with images because images are uh, always going to have to be a, a bitmap. Um, so you will have to use these for, for, some, for some parts of your, of your figures. Uh, but if you're making plots, if you're making illustrations, uh, these file formats are definitely ways to help preserve the, the quality. 
Um, I have a question. Yeah. Hey, Vish. So, so uh, I, I understand why vector graphics are better, right? But right. the thing is, when you, you make them in Illustrator or Inkscape or whatever, after that, you have to transfer it into a Word document or something, right? When you are putting together your figures. Right. So how do you, how do you go about that? What do you do there? Yeah, so there's a, yeah, it's a, so, so, so EMF and WMF are formats that are, vector formats that are compatible with Word. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Some things, so for example, these, these formats, they can't handle transparencies. So sometimes when you, if you're working in one program and switch it to other, there are certain details that might get lost. Uh, I know if you're using Word on a, uh, on a Mac, you can actually save it as a PDF, which PDFs are also, they, save as, they can save it as vector formats. If you're using LaTeX or other, um, approaches to kind of craft your documents. Uh, these also handle these format files. Uh, so sometimes it is not annoying. Sometimes it can be annoying trying to get the, the formatting properly. Um, and it really just depends on which, which hardware, which software you're working with. Oh, okay, thanks. Great. Uh, Inkscape is free. I guess one caveat, and I guess I think Vish can attest to this, is that the current version of Inkscape, the Mac compatibility is not that great. Illustrator definitely works well. It is not a free program, but it works uh, fairly well. Power, PowerPoint is actually, uh, you can make quite nice schematics in PowerPoint if you spend enough time working with it. Um, I've seen some pretty uh, impressive things out of, out of PowerPoint. Yeah, uh, Inkscape actually, even on a Mac, it downloads it so that you will run it in a Windows simulator. So that's kind of why it's like really laggy. It's pretty terrible to use. Yeah, and I'm not sure if, so the, they, they released the latest version, which might do it actually in the native uh, Mac um, kind of software, but I'm not sure. I think Dan tried it and didn't work that great. I think, yeah, so I guess the, the point trying to make is there are a lot of different tools you should be aware of these things, uh, find what works best for you, but uh, it really doesn't, you, you can always make some, you can make nice quality figures with really uh, many of these different software. So just figure out what works best for you. So in terms of, in terms of actually plotting, so here's, a, here's an example of just a uh, plot I constructed in MATLAB. Uh, on the left is a TIFF image, on the right is an SVG. Uh, so, Right now, they seem mostly comparable. It's hard to see the difference. If you zoom in, you can see clearly with the TIFF image that it's a pixelated image. Uh, you lose quality as you, as you zoom into this. So if you're, say for example, you download a PDF of a paper and you wanna kind of zoom in on some data points, uh, it would be blurred and you wouldn't be able to see details. Whereas with the uh, vector graphics, no matter how far you zoom in, and this also works with PowerPoint too. So this is just, I put the vector graphic uh, in directly into, uh, into PowerPoint. I was able to crop it and scale it, and it still preserves the, the image quality. Uh, and I think, I, I guess I can maybe bring up uh, one of these examples. But, so there's also another advantage to uh, using these vector formats, and that's if, for, especially for plots, is that it lets you when you're compiling your data, you can actually edit a lot of these things in the software. So say you generate a plot in MATLAB and you're kind of compiling a figure together and you're like, oh, I don't really like the font size that's associated with it. You can actually, if you're using a compatible like vector format software, say like Inkscape, you can actually edit a lot of the details in that software. So font size, the data point size, the line widths, these are all things that are they're editable because they're saved as like, individual objects within the file instead of a kind of pixelated image. And I'll, I'll show some examples uh, later on, kind of going through that and how you can kind of change these things. Uh, some, some tips really to kind of improving your, your, your plots. I was going to kind of go through kind of like an example, a simple plot. Uh, so, so this is a default plot from MATLAB. You can kind of understand what is being depicted here. There's, uh, there's three people, 
from our lab, Kike, Rob, and myself, uh, is describing how our sanity changes over time relative to how many days we're spending in lab. Um, it's a it's a plot that you can understand, but it's also if you can imagine if you shrink this into a, in a research article, maybe it's a little bit harder to look at. It's not aesthetically that pleasing. Um, the texts are kind of small. The lines are hard to distinguish just by color from immediately. Um, there's some things that are not perfect about this figure. And I'll kind of want to say as a, as a rule of thumb, uh, if you see a, if you have a plot and you can immediately tell which program that plot was used to make, uh, to make that uh, data or to plot that data, then you probably didn't spend enough time formatting it. Um, so if you look at something you're like, okay, that's like default Excel uh, format. Um, it really kind of, one, it doesn't, it usually doesn't look that great. Two, it kind of signals that you didn't spend that much time um, working on it and kind of crafting it to, uh, to a format that you think looks better and also conveys information better. Uh, I can share this a bit later. We have it on our GitLab. I need to update this, but I have some default function, or not default, but I have functions that I've built in MATLAB that make it super trivial to, uh, um, to change the, the plotting uh, of, the, of your figures. So if you take it from a default, we have a, I have a function that I made called uh, pubfig, which is just it's like a, basically a function that makes publication figures. Um, and so when you run that, uh, and you can adjust some of these settings, but the, the main idea is it, it increases the font size so you can have a, a plot that doesn't take up as much space, but still is easy to kind of understand and see. Um, it changes direction of, and size of the, the ticks, and a lot of things are up to preference too, so you can adjust it to however format that you, that you like. Uh, for instance, I don't like having the legend box, so I remove that. Um, it also increases the, the line thickness. Uh, and I'm gonna open up, and it's pretty easy to use, so I'm opening up MATLAB right now. So I just have a simple plot right here. I'm just generating data. Let's see if it actually plots it. Come on. Okay, so it looks something like this. Um, and then all you have to do differently in this case, so I'm just gonna add a line that says pubfig. I have a function in my, uh, in my, uh, in my folder. So it, it literally will just grab whatever the most recent figure is and then it'll just adjust it according to my specifications. Um, and if I go into here, so this is, I've been working on this since uh, maybe like eight years now. I've just been slowly updating. I had like some uh, MATLAB uh, function software that I got off from like the, the MATLAB database that I had initially started with and then I started editing over the time. There's a lot of things here, but um, there's some simple things where you can just change the defaults of the font. Um, if you want, if you have like a specific size that you need of a figure, um, one thing that's nice with the way I've coded this, and I'll, I'll share this with everyone, uh, is if you say you don't like the size or the things or you want to change the settings, I also set it up if there's like an option that it'll bring up a, where is it? Aha. Have to, great. I'll uh, bring up a, a menu here and you can, so it's like, okay, I want a width of three inches. I like this aspect ratio. I want the font size to be smaller. I want the marker size. Well, we're not having, using markers here. Uh, I'd say I want the tick length to be a little bit shorter. Um, you can adjust all these things and it'll automatically uh, set it up for you. And if you want to save it as a, as a vector format, so if you go here, save as, and you can have a location and then, so EPS, EMF, uh, PDF, uh, SVG, these are all uh, vector formats. I usually save as SVG, this is what's natively used in, in Inkscape, but most of these formats uh, will work. Great, hey, Joe. Yeah. So uh, in, the, in the options menu that you just pulled up for PubFig, mm -hmm. Width is what is the width of the final figure? Uh, yeah, I think it's the outer box. 
It's not exact. Oh, I still okay. do most of my editing in Inkscape if I need to adjust the size, okay. but at least it lets me get close. Yeah, yeah, so you can edit, like you can say the final outer box, I want it three inches or two or whatever. Yeah, if you want to. Sometimes it's, uh, and you have to kind of scale down the sizes. Right, of right. So this would be like okay. a taller one that's even smaller. Um, okay. And you can kind of get a sense too of what it'll look like when you're trying to fit a, a, a graph into a small section of a, of a, yeah. of a paper. Of your paper uh, too. I think I think that's quite neat because a lot of times that's what I do struggle with because I have my figure, but then that is at some size, but then when I put it on Word, it needs to fit in with like all the other figures, all the other data and charts within the same figure. Right. Uh, one thing that's nice too is that even if it doesn't get you to the exact size you want, it makes it easier to normalize your plot size between uh between different plots. So if you have like five different plots and you, because uh, otherwise, right, a lot of times people are like, oh, okay, I'll just spread this out until I get to the size I want. But if you do that, then it's, if you have multiple plots, it's hard to um, keep them the same. And you can, I mean, you can always program directly in MATLAB uh, to make it a certain size. It just takes a lot more effort for the, for the editing. So I think like changing this, for example, this figure from the default would probably have maybe like 20 lines of more code that you'd have to write. And so it's, kind of a pain to have to just write it over and over again. Uh, let's go back here. Great, uh, kind of back where we were before. So here's a figure. Um, and kind of the next thing I wanted to bring up is, okay, so this is, this is all right to distinguish. It's not like a perfect figure. Um, but really when you're plotting, you need to think about to how, how you want to plot your data. What makes sense? So here I'm drawing lines, but maybe this isn't, is this a continuous data set? Is it a, is a simulation or is it experimental data? Is it a survey, for example? Um, so if it's an experiment where you're, say, surveying at different days from multiple people, and then you're taking an average of, of that, of maybe that survey, um, this doesn't represent all of that information. So in that case, you might want to have distinct data points for each of those um, different time points. You want to include error bars, which usually you're conveying standard deviation. Um, so this is giving you one, it's giving you more information about kind of how the experiment or the uh, was uh, performed or which data was collected. Um, and it's also a lot more transparent. So there's, uh, there's more information being uh, delivered in this case. And so I usually like for my workflow at least, I'll kind of take this mostly finished image and then I'll do my final touches when I'm kind of compiling. So, and it depends on the journals too, and I'll go into a little more, but uh, at least for a lot of journals that we submit to, it's usually not just one plot. It's usually a few plots kind of compiled together that have uh, one, one overall message for the, for the figure. Um, but for this, for example, if you wanted to kind of touch it up a little more, uh, you can think of ways how to better engage the information that's being conveyed. So for example, uh, right here, I'm trying to convey information about three different people in our lab. Um, maybe that's not immediately obvious unless you know who this is. Um, so one modification you could do is say, put the figure, put the images of the people uh, inside the plot and have it color coded to um, whatever data is correlated with it. Um, this is all can be done in, uh, in Inkscape. Um, here, for example, I did some other slight touches too. So um, if you have colors in your plots, you might as well use them to uh, kind of convey additional information. So here in this case, we're talking about uh, someone's uh, mental state of being, but they're, they're, they're quote unquote sanity. Um, so here I'm using kind of blue colors to convey someone who's uh, maybe has, is, maybe more stable emotionally. Um, and then for myself down here, I'm using maybe warmer colors that uh, are convey kind of the opposite, uh, the opposite feeling. And I mean, this is like kind of a very uh, random example, but there's, there's definitely ways when you're, um, depending on what your experiments or what you're trying to convey, there's, you should really think about how all these details are conveying information to, to people, even if it's like not, as obvious and more on a subconscious level, uh, it still can help. Uh, and yeah, 
I think, uh, and so if you're curious what it looks like, let me see if I can open up. Right, so this is Inkscape right here. The, compared to Illustrator, I think it's a lot more simple. Um, and I can kind of go through uh, some examples later, but there's like really uh, oops, like simple shapes that you can make with it. Um, and there's tricks to do like pretty like nice looking geometries or things uh, pretty easily. Um, you can change the colors pretty easily. You can make gradients if you want to make gradients. Um, but when you when you drag a plot, say from MATLAB, if it's saved appropriately in here, you can actually go in and adjust things like the font size. So I can make this larger if I want. You can actually say you don't like the line thickness. You can actually go here and adjust the line thickness to make it thinner or thicker. Or in my case, I actually went through and I changed the color of some of these uh, these plots, how I sauce it. And so it's nice because it, it makes it easier to kind of play around with it if you're trying to, instead of having to manually type in and change or click on a, a bunch of things and the other plotting software to get it to the format you like. Um, and then you can kind of group things. Uh, in this case, uh, I just have kind of drew a box around this. Um, so it's, it's nice for, especially, and I'll, I'll kind of go over it in the next example, when you're trying to construct a lot of elements, um, there's conveniences in having like one kind of interface that you're working with. And you can do similar things in, in PowerPoint too. Um, especially if you're working from Excel into, into PowerPoint. Um, so it's, it's not just unique to this, to this program. So Joe? Yeah. Um, you said if the file format is appropriate, you can like edit it on Inkscape, right? Right, right, right. So for every vector format or the one that you mentioned? Uh, I, you can do pretty much any vector format. So some of them it'll like import, but usually it's pretty good about it. So SVG, you tend to not have any conversion issues. I've used EMF, I've used PDFs before. Um, it's usually pretty good about handling it. Okay, thanks. Yep. I have a question about uh, the images that you used here, because I can see all the other elements in this are definitely um, vector elements, but it seems right. to me like it's an odd mix where you actually have images in there. Uh, do you know, how's that handled? I haven't really, I've used Inkscape before, but I haven't really seen that functionality. Yeah, so you can, um, anything that's not vectorized, it, it, it just raster, it rasterizes it. And you can do that in the form, in the file format, it lets you do that. It lets you have a combination of the two. It's just that obviously it's not gonna be preserved if you, if you zoom in, like you're gonna lose some quality at some point, right? Okay. Um, but it, it, the, the file formats are usually meant to be able to handle, handle both. You can have, some issues when they're combined and you're trying to get it to, yeah, there's some importing, exporting things when you're working with Word. Word's usually not that great at, at dealing with this, but um, things like LaTeX actually are really great at handling these, these, these formats. Um, so if you're using, uh, what's, the, what's the one that everyone uses? I always forget. Overleaf, if you lose Overleaf, it should work fine, I think. Um, Great, so I think uh, kind of going on here. So this is where we kind of started with. This is what our final little figure looked at that we ended up with. Um, and you can see that just like immediately, it's, it's one, we're conveying our data more properly. It's kind of easy to see what these, these datas are uh, correlating to. If you, you can, this is made large right now, but you can imagine this could be a half column figure and, really easily be uh, read and understood. Uh, another point I wanted to bring up is that um, you should put some thought into the colors that you're using when you're, when you're formatting things. Um, especially if, actually, so there's a lot of people who are um, kind of work in like applied math or, or physics. Uh, some of those journals still do black and white or black and white is common. Um, so you should, if you are including color and plan to have it, uh, you, you should you should think of how it looks on the grayscale uh, as well as in color, um, and it's also good to think about how, say, for example, like different color maps, how they will be distinguished if it's one if it's grayscale, but also two if you're uh, if you're someone who's colorblind and can't 
actually distinguish the color spectrum as well. Um, so this is just a, this is a plot that just shows what different color maps look like uh, for um, different types of color blindness. Uh, and you see ones that like uh, jet it works. It's not, it's not the greatest. I think um, this doesn't include, Perula is like the new MATLAB color map that um, is, it was designed to be very distinguishable even if it's uh, someone who's like colorblind. Um, and so you see a lot of these programs are kind of updating to uh, accommodate for that, for that now. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, if you take like a simple plot like this and RGB, uh, it's actually pretty distinguishable still if you have some weak color blindness, but in grayscale, you can imagine that these are terribly difficult <laughs> to actually distinguish like which one correlates to width. Like this one's obviously lighter, but then these ones aren't as obvious. Um, and this is also something you can uh, fix by just adding markers that have different shapes or by using different styles of dashed lines. Um, but it's just something to think about when you're kind of formatting things. Um, if we go back to my other example, we can kind of see here that on grayscale, we're able to distinguish these things. One, because the markers are different. We have triangles, we have squares, we have circles. The shades are all distinguishable enough from each other. Uh, if I was to actually edit something, uh, one thing right now is it's not clear which one of these marker shapes actually goes with my, my picture legend. So um, that's something that could be improved slightly. But at least the, the colors are, are distinguishable. Um, so this is just kind of, I just did an overview of, of how to kind of, kind of rationale through like a single figure. Um, I wanted to kind of discuss now about how you would compose an entire figure that maybe includes multiple components. So either schematics, include data, um, include some experimental images. Um, and so I just kind of want to go through like the process with an example. Um, feel free to stop well, me. If actually, you have, Joe. Yeah. Uh, before you get into that, just relating to the earlier point, even on, so on photo, uh, sorry, Illustrator, there yes. is an option when you go into like view, there is a way where it'll show you what someone with a particular kind of color blindness will see your figure as. So oh, it'll yeah. change. So you can also preview your figures that way. Yeah, I forgot to, that's, that's a great point. I forgot to bring it up. Um, yeah, so for these ones, for example, I was it, in Inkscape, they have a similar thing. If you go to, uh, like the toolbox and go to filters, color, and then color blindness. They have options for like these different types of color blindness. So you can kind of preview it. And I think I'm sure PowerPoint has similar things, or you can at least do grayscale um, pretty easily. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, cool. So kind of going through this. Uh, first thing. So one obviously keep your keep your audience um, in mind right is this a is it a very general audience are you going to have to convey uh, more simple concepts first to even like get the idea across or is it a very specific audience that is like already very technically aware of the um, subject you're, you're going to be discussing uh, uh, one thing you could do is look at um, journals that you would potentially submit to and see what other people have done um, and this one gives you an idea of maybe what type of style that um, that journal prefers or how people normally convey information in that journal. Um, this is also useful if say an editor is looking at their paper, if they if it if it looks similar to like something that they normally publish into their journal, um, they're maybe more willing to kind of on a subconscious level even um, give it a give it a chance. Um, but you can always like there's there's always good examples and bad examples too. So just like keep a mindful eye on to what people are doing well and what people are doing bad. Uh, and there's definitely different styles that kind of emerged in a lot of these different journals. Um, here are some, some examples. Uh, so this is a paper from our lab in PNAS. Um, it's a kind of experimental slash uh, kind of theory-based paper. Uh, it includes multiple components, includes a schematic up here, it includes some experimental images. Um, it includes some more experimental images down here. Um, and it's, I'd say, aesthetically pleasing. It's, uh, it's using kind of colors in a way that allows you to kind of correlate some of these things. 
Um, this is like intended more for a general audience. Uh, this is a paper from PRL. So this is more of a physics focused journal. I think probably at the time they weren't even using color. So everything's in grayscale. It's very kind of practical and to the point, like here are the dimensions, here's the details, here's the data, here's the experimental image. Uh, and this is an example from our lab pretty recently. So this was published in Nature Biomedical Engineering. So this is like a very uh, broad audience scientific journal. So it's, it's targeting, it's, it's, you can see here like they're, they're really looking for a very clean aesthetic. So having these like really polished figures that have like nice schematics and just look very appealing because they want to kind of be able to highlight that when they're, when they're publishing their, their journal. So just something to keep in mind even before you start, uh, start working on, working on making your, your figures. In terms of actually uh, composing, uh, so the first step, just you want to determine what you want to actually convey in your figure, really, because your, your figure, the whole purpose of it is to convey information. So you want to have a clear idea of, of what you're trying to do, what it, what's the uh, objective, right? Um, so here I'm going through an example from one of my papers. Um, so my objective was to create a schematic that showed a process. In this case, we showed a, made a process to make hydrogel particles um, in high throughput and use them for tissue engineering applications. Uh, and maybe I have some sub points that I want to address. So I want to make sure people get an idea of what the device looks like. Uh, I want them to be able to see um, how the droplets or the, the microgels are actually made um, and what I'm actually using them for in the, in the, in the paper. And, and then I'm keeping in mind too that this, so this is more geared towards a material science and engineering focused journal. So in those ones, I, I know that they tend to like these maybe larger figures with so maybe cleaner illustrations and showing uh, kind of a lot of experimental images as well mixed in with schematics. Uh, and here's the citation. But so, so once you have an idea of what you want to kind of convey in the figure, next step is just sketch a rough draft. Um, so just kind of playing around on paper. You can also do it on your computer. But here's an example from mine. So I was just kind of sketching out like, okay, maybe I'll include a schematic of my device here, just writing in like, oh, I'll include an image of this, I'll have some schematic of that, uh, and put some other things here. And so I'm kind of just framing it um, to how I would envision it uh, show up. And so sometimes you'll, you'll want to edit this too, and it helps you uh, kind of frame a nice uh, tight uh, <clears throat> illustration and figure. Uh, so next up, once you start getting data, you can start actually compiling this. Um, and so this is actually after quite a few steps, but this was an intermediate version of the, of the figure. So here we have our schematic illustration of this device that we built. Um, we're injecting some polymer solutions in. Um, we're using oil and surfactant as a way to create these uniform drops in this device. I'm kind of going over briefly what the mechanism is for how we go from a droplet to a gel. And then I'm showing here um, how we're actually using that. So in this case, we're using them as a way to make these kind of beaded scaffolds that allow cells to grow and proliferate. And, um, but even with this, for example, like I, so there's some things I'll point out that I don't quite like with this figure. So for example, here the scale bar is a little small, so it's kind of hard to, to read. Uh, over here, this step is maybe, uh, I had some feedback that this step was not really clear how exactly this was done. It was just kind of like in your imagination. Um, so here's the kind of after kind of revising some of these things, here's a final figure. Um, and there's also a lot of other differences too. So we actually redesigned the device. Um, we did some other things, but uh, really just kind of editing this over time. Uh, so, so the scale bar is a little easier to read here. We actually changed the polymers we're using a little bit. Uh, this step I included a schematic to try and make it a little more clear how exactly we're doing these steps. Um, and then this was the kind of finalized figure for that. And I think I can pull it up on, one sec. Let me open it in. Oh, uh, here we go. So this is what the figure looks like in is loading up right now. 
Um, I have a question in the meantime. Then. Yeah. So how do you decide um, like what sections of the figure to make the different sub figures like A, B, and C in this case? Yeah, so like what, like topically what to include? Yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, for this, for example, I had a clear, uh, I had a, a clear workflow um, that I wanted to describe. So if it's a workflow, for example, it's maybe a little simpler because you're just going kind of chronological. Um, so in, to convey my workflow, I need the, uh, the first step is we generate drops. The second step is we cross-link them. The third step is, well, we do some stuff in between, but then we, um, but then we use them for our application. If it's maybe, uh, yeah, I think uh, in general, but I think, yeah, you can apply it in general. So if, um, for example, if you're, just, if you're just trying to explain some data, right? If you have some data that you're trying to explain a result with, it would usually make sense to include the schematic before the data if the schematic helps you um, envision what the data is trying to, to show. So if the data comes first, then you see that, because that's the first thing you're gonna look at. And so if you, if you need something farther down to understand prior, um, that doesn't make sense. So it's usually you wanna configure it in a way where um, it's just like reading a, reading a sentence, reading a, a page. Um, it's in an order that makes sense to understand it uh, chronologically. And there's, there's some tricks with that too. Um, so here, yeah, we have, I have experimental images that are included in um, kind of this larger format. Uh, what, one thing I like to do, at least with this, is I'll, I'll create a work page that is the size of an actual page of paper, and then I, send, I set these guidelines to the boundary so I actually can make the figure to the appropriate size. So if you're doing like maybe a half column figure, you'd want to include it in the space here. And then this also lets me kind of format the the font size to something I know that'll be legible when it's actually put into the, into the manuscript. So here I'm kind of being generous. I'm using size 11 font for these uh, kind of sub, uh, subsections of the figure. For some of the less important things, you can afford to be smaller. You can do like size eight. I think down to usually seven is probably the lowest you'd want to go. Um, maybe for like the tick marks on a, on a plot or something. Uh, and so, yeah, it's nice with this because it lets you kind of real, like kind of play around with all the components all at once and rearrange things as you need. Um, and there's also tools to say, if you want to make these aligned, it'll align them, um, set up. You'll kind of notice that I definitely with these, I pay attention to how everything lines up. So if things line up well, it's usually more appealing to look at. So if I, if I offset this like a little bit, it would just kind of look a little bit strange to someone um, kind of looking at this. So you'll notice that like a lot of these sections I try and line up as, uh, as best as possible. Sometimes you can't and that's fine. Um, and I guess also too to try and kind of highlight how, uh, so some of the, like, so for example, this I actually made in Inkscape. So this was not like a 3D rendering or anything. Um, these, these particles, I just literally combine different circles with different gradients together um, to kind of create this 3D looking effect or a transparent 3D looking effect. Uh, this, <laughs> I don't know if I would recommend doing this necessarily, uh, but to construct this kind of 3D thing, I actually just did a bunch of um, kind of perspective lines and then actually constructed it in here piece by piece. So if you can actually go through and break this apart. And it's just like a bunch of different components that I compiled. So it's just like a lot of squares, lines, and gradients and things. Uh, this took a little bit longer. Um, I realized after actually, I was gonna show another example. Um, so I actually, so for this, this paper, we actually got the, uh, did the cover art for it. Let me see if I find it. So this was the cover art we made. So I actually made this in Inkscape. Um, and if I actually open that up, this, I mean, this is clearly more advanced, but I just wanna like highlight that you can, even just taking like simple shapes, and then if you know how to kind of compile them together, you can make a uh, pretty uh, nice looking images. And so this, 
Uh, it's just, and you can kind of see here, oops, a few layers. So I, in this case, I kind of set up a bunch of different layers to make it easier to follow what's going on. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you, if you get familiar with these systems, you actually make these pretty elaborate um, illustrations. So this I did not actually draw at all in, uh, in here, because that would be, oh, that would be, that would be painful. So what I did do, which I found was a nice trick, is that you can actually take a 3D like AutoCAD, it's like a, um, any type of modeling software, you can create a, see if I can find, get it to open, open. You can export it as like a PDF. And then, so I did that with like an AutoCAD design and then I imported it into Inkscape and then it converts it to the vector format because it's a PDF. And so I was able to just kind of click on all these and add, add lines, add, add gradients. Add, I don't know if it'll let me do it, but it might get angry at me because it's kind of a large file. Uh, but, uh, oh no, too many layers. Actually, and just to kind of highlight that you don't need to even use like this fancy of a software too. So we actually had, uh, so Reem in our lab, so this was a cover art she actually made that got onto Lab on Chip. And so this was actually made in PowerPoint. And I didn't believe her at first, but then as I looked closer, I realized, okay, maybe, yeah, this could actually be done. I think she exported maybe this out of MATLAB. But just using, just using PowerPoint to make graphics, she was able to get, uh, she actually got the, I think the front cover uh, of, the, of the journal for this, for this article, which I thought was pretty cool and impressive. Um, and so I think kind of tying in that point, like as, as long as you have like a nice vision for these things, it really doesn't matter which tools you're using as long as you um, use them well and, and kind of think, think through the process. Uh, and just kind of touching up on these notes, if you, uh, let me skip through here. Great, uh, so just kind of some, some final thoughts. Like, uh, really this is an iterative process, so like don't be afraid, you don't have to get it right the first time, it's best to just really sketch things through and iterate and iterate and you'll kind of improve over time. Uh, and if you're gonna spend time making figures, make sure you prioritize ones that are useful. So uh, sometimes you can fall into a trap of spending a lot of time formatting something or like trying to plot data a perfect way. And if it's just gonna be used one time in a presentation or maybe it'll get put into supplemental information of a manuscript, maybe it's not as worth spending that much time on. And this may be one of practice, but it's definitely good to prioritize uh, things that are maybe more will eventually get put as like a main figure in a presentation or sorry in a manuscript um, and yeah try not to you don't have to overcomplicate things too I mean so that's why it's good to from the beginning really construct what you want to convey in a figure and have an outline of the the main message you want to make um, and this helps you kind of focus your attention to uh, really making something that's concise that conveys the information you want to to convey without having too much like say you don't want to have too complicated of a design that maybe distracts the reader from the actual data that you're trying to share so it's just something to keep in mind uh, and I think the the small details although they're not as noticeable to maybe to every people don't immediately notice them unless they pay attention to these things, but they're also, you notice them subconsciously. So things like how figures align, the font size, the colors used, um, all of these small details, although they get neglected, I think they're important for crafting something that, um, that looks great and will have your, your readers or your audience uh, really kind of appreciate the work more. So on that note, if you have questions, uh, I think we're running out of time now anyways. I can go through some other things if you want, but um, on that note, I'll end my presentation. I have I a guess question. I have one other okay, question. Simon, oh. you can go. Simon, okay, you can go. thanks. Um, so in, um, 
our meeting yesterday, you had those figures or those like little figures of the um, spheres kind of mushing into each other. Oh yeah. Um, so like, I'm just wondering, it seems like they match the photos pretty well. How mm -hmm. do you actually create those and like make things that match photos or like microscope images? Yeah, I think, um, I, maybe part of that is practice. I don't know if I have an example here. I can open up a new document too. Uh, nice thing with a lot of things that we work with is that they're very simple shapes. So you can actually get pretty uh, nice, uh, I don't think I need the grid. You can make pretty nice things pretty quickly just by like, just kind of knowing some small, uh, in this case, setting. So if just like editing maybe some slight gradients here or doing uh, masking or something. So here if I, maybe I'm making a gray hydrogel or something, I don't know. I don't really like this color, but, um, or I say, you know, maybe, do, do, do. You can add something with maybe a little more transparency, maybe a little color. Um, something like that. Uh, but you can also like, um, yeah, I think simple shapes are pretty easy to make and it's nice because you can just copy and paste them too. Uh, but yeah, I think like for that, for example, I, I know what you're talking about. Um, uh, for that, for example, like I think I had two spheres next to each other that were deforming. So I think I set them up so that they, oops, just had them aligned, had them touching, uh, and I wanted to show deformation. So right now it's a circle, but I could do is say convert it to like a, there's a lot of tricks with a lot of these softwares, but they could literally do this and like incrementally change some, some part of it. And so in like this case, I have like two particles that are pushing into each other Oops. and slightly, which one am I looking for? I think it's this one. No, I'm going to get this. There we go. Uh, yeah, I, uh, honestly, I just like, you can, you can always put the image in it too and uh, kind of adjust it to get it to the, oops the exact shape you want, or you can actually, so depending on what you're trying to do as well, you can, um, you could always trace it. You can always import it and then, um, and then trace the object too. Uh, there's some other interesting things you can do as well, where if you say you have, you can actually, um, the object, Right, so this was like a larger image that I actually clipped. Um, you can actually like go in and maybe, I'm gonna do a really quick version, but you can actually like go in and have a very detailed crop. Um, say if you wanna extract parts of images and things. Um, oops, so like here's the outline that I made. And you could literally just go like, boop, boop, and clip it out and do like simple edits and things like that. Um, sorry, did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, Kyung, sorry, did you have? Uh... Yeah, so um, it seems like when you make your figures, uh, you have all the, uh, what is it, sub-labels, like A, B, C, um, together in the figure? Right. Do you have ideas how to make like each um, like sub-figure individually and like, uh, some ways that you would because I use a uh, latex overleaf mm -hmm. that means like usually you would have some figures and each figure is itself and like how would so my my question might be like so I have like say you have the three sub figures right now right individually uh, like how would you uh, organize their like size so that like when you plot it put it on overleaf they would like match nicely Ah, so I guess, so for overleaf, you can actually compile multiple sub figures is, is what you're saying, correct? Yep. Um, and do you need to do that in order to have it have a unique identifier? Or could you just, if, if you save this as a PDF, 
could you just input? You, you can do that, but like one thing you one thing in Overleaf that you do is you label your sub figures and you refer them like later. Right. Uh, so if you don't have that, you have to every time you uh, like refer a figure, you have to like say like figure this is figure five. Then you have to like figure five and A. And sometimes right. maybe if you change the figure, uh, it won't automatically change. So you have to search for all the figures, which is a little bit more. Yeah, that's I can see how that'd be annoying. I think well, at the very least, you could always have it refer to the uh, the the single figure. Yeah, the single if, figure. If you yeah. move the sub figures around, then obviously you'd have to to change it. I know I. Uh, yeah, I guess it depends on how how frequently you would change the ordering of these. Um, I, I do. I do understand what you're you're saying. There might be some. So in Overleaf, you can like in LaTeX, you can actually uh, decide like your size of your sub figure. Okay, but I see. Um, I'm not sure how that will like how you would incorporate Inkscape so that that will be like uh this. Yeah, I guess if you. So the one option is you just you compile the the you just compile the whole figure and then you have to yeah unfortunately there might be I I would I would even be checked there might be some workarounds for that although you would still have to manually update the sub figure references yeah they they also automatically assign some like um, margin between those figures so right that's also kind of yeah, but I mean, yes, yeah, so I guess the I, the only immediate workaround I could see is that you'd have to manually label the sub figures, but you could easily put this whole entire figure in, um, yeah. or if you have some design for like a another figure, uh, and I guess it, it really depends too, like what you're more comfortable working with. Like you don't have to compile them. I like to compile them in this because I add a lot of schematics for my for my for my things, um, and so I like having more flexibility with when I'm working instead of having to have three like multiple separate files that I'm trying to maybe <laughs> scale just right and get it to fit in a perfect way. But for some things, yeah, if you have like, like maybe it's just a schematic and a plot underneath or a figure underneath or an image underneath, um, it could be easier to do it, to do it that way, right? Where you just coding in and overleaf and saying, okay, so uh, figure one, a insert this figure one B insert this, um, okay, thanks. I think yep. that helps. So, but, yeah. Yeah. Great. Did anyone else have any questions? And I'll, I'll put some of this information, I'll send an email out um, to people. Cool. Okay, I guess on that note, I'm going to end this uh, session. Thanks for, for coming out. Um, I hope people found some parts of it uh, helpful or useful. Um, if you have other questions, I, I don't know, I, I love talking about these types of things. That's why I, like, uh, well, I was excited to kind of give, give, this, give this talk. Um, but uh, yeah, just let me know. Oh, yeah. My, okay, one question. Yeah. <laughs> Minor question. So if you like, you're presenting it to like a in-group meeting, how much like, effort would you put on your figures uh personally, personally. i i don't i don't i don't try and put too, i i fall into the fallacy of spending too much time uh because i i like to distract myself with it um i well the other thing too is that once you uh i guess it's also how much uh how comfortable you are with like Inkscape and yeah yeah, yeah. so like there's some things and I know I've like because I've helped other people kind of get um, kind of learn the software too and in the beginning it's always going to be kind of slow and that's why some like things like PowerPoint are sometimes better for just doing like really quick things for presentations um, but like some once you get like quick at it and at least know the the uh, kind of all the the tools and stuff you can make pretty nice figures like pretty quickly so like I, I won't spend more than like 30 minutes making okay. stuff for like a presentation or the other thing too is like um, you can imagine that once you have uh, they're like they're like building blocks too so like once you have something made in here so say I want to I could 
easily take, uh, I think, oh, let's go to, sorry, I was showing the wrong screen. Um, you can easily go to your, um, you can easily like take components of previous figures, which I do a lot. And I'll use the, you could use these to uh, kind of combine to make uh, something else, right? Um, so you don't have to make it again every time. Uh, or some like uh, I, I do that a lot with some of the other projects where I have a lot of these crescent shaped particles and so like oh, I'll put a cell in this one or I'll just change it to add this little thing so a lot most of the time I have 80% of the figure already made and it's just adding some adjustments okay yeah, that's thanks. it it's actually yeah it's a good point because once you it, you're kind of building up like a, a toolbox too um, and I know Dino does this a lot too like when he's applying the grants he just has like this one illustration of a cell that he's probably used for like 10 years <laughs> uh, you just spend a lot of time making it nice to begin with and then you can just um you can just recycle it as you as you move forward or make small adjustments as you go mm -hmm. okay thanks yep thanks joe yeah thanks for thanks for coming out everyone yeah uh, Bye. So that is the end of our figure making seminar. If you would like to check out more videos like this or want to learn more about our work in the DeCarlo Lab, please check out our website. See you next time.